Hello there. This is a continuation of our year-long programs, and this particular edition is New Mexico Statehood. Why did it take so long? It took more than 60 years from the day New Mexico became a territory of the United States until January of 1912 when New Mexico finally became the 47th state. What took so long? Other states were territories for a much shorter period. Nevada, for instance, took only three years from being a territory to statehood. And even Utah, which originally resisted the straight statehood idea, had to wait 40-some years. What took so long? Researchers reveal that a variety of factors conspired to slow the process. Some were political, like the Civil War and the Free Silver Debate, and others were less understandable. Racism, religious intolerance, and other prejudice impeded the road to statehood, and the history of the quest to become the 47th state of the Union cast some unflattering light on the society and politics of the 19th century America. New Mexico was annexed to the United States in 1848 at the close of the Mexican War. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was negotiated between the United States government and Mexico, originally called for New Mexico to become a state as soon as possible. But the United States Senate changed that wording to, at the proper time, a foretaste of Washington foot-dragging to come. On October 12, 1848, a convention of New Mexicans petitioned Congress to establish civil territorial government. Congress ignored this petition. On September 24, 1849, a New Mexico convention adopted a plan of territorial government and sent a delegate and sent delegates to Congress. Congress ignored plan and refused to seat the delegate. On October, tw on June 20th, 1850, a constitution for a state government was adopted and submitted to Congress. Again, it was ignored by Congress. Then on September 9th, 1850, the so-called Organic Act was passed by Congress, making New Mexico a territory. This decision was linked to the Compromise of 1850, which was Congress's attempt to try to avoid the Civil War. During the Civil War period, questions arose about the loyalty of New Mexicans to the United States. Though the battles fought on New Mexico soil were largely invasions from Confederate Texas that were resisted and repealed by New Mexican forces loyal to the Union. Historian R. W. Larson sums up why New Mexico was so long denied statehood by writing, Despite increasing numbers of New Mexicans determined to rise above the colonial or second-class territorial citizenship. Scrutiny reveals New Mexico was never considered in the same light as other territories because of prejudice toward Spanish-speaking Roman Catholic people of New Mexico. That was the major objection and obstruction to the territory statehood aspirations. New Mexicans were labeled by one congressman a race speaking an alien language and not representing the best blood on the American continent. But New Mexicans never gave up their efforts to join with the American Union as promised in the 1848 tre Treaty with Mexico. Efforts in the 1870s and the 1880s were complicated by the free silver movement, which pitted western silver miners, including those in Sierra County, against established eastern banking interests that insisted on a gold standard for American currency. Sierra County was a large silver producer, 
At one point, the U.S. Treasury had a silver mine in chloride, which dug up metal to be made into money. And some of the silver found in Lake Valley was purer than the silver dollars that came out of the United States Mint. Politicians in New Mexico tended to favor free silver, and it was beneficial to the miners, ranchers, and farmers, and they were their constituents. When New Mexico statehood came up for consideration in Washington, congressmen from the eastern states and representatives of banking interest doubted whether they wanted to add two pro-silver New Mexico senators to the Washington political mix. In the post-Civil War period, New Mexico experienced problems associated with its growth and economic development. As New Mexico grew, much of the vast territory remained at the periphery of the effective enforcement. During this Wild West period of our history, several areas of the territory experienced rampant lawlessness and regional conflict from which was often complicated by political and commercial rivalries. This period was exemplified by the Lincoln County Wars of 1878 to 1880, which witnessed the rise of the infamous outlaws such as William Billy the Kid Bonnie. The Apache Wars, which made New Mexico natives fought to protect their ancestral lands from the encroaching American settlers, provided the newspapers of the East with lurid stories and the politicians with justification why such a wild and lawless place should not be part of the American nation. When Congressman William Springer, Democrat of Illinois, introduced a bill for New Mexico statehood in March 13, 1889, Eastern and Midwestern newspapers, mainly Republican in affiliation, criticized New Mexico in these words. The Chicago Tribune wrote, New Mexicans are not American, but greaser, persons ignorant of our laws, manners, customs, language, and institutions, lazy, shiftless, grossly illiterate, and superstitious, at the mercy of unscrupulous rings of politicians. A document called the Stubble Report cited El Gringo, or New Mexico and Her People, by W.W.H. Davis as proof that New Mexicans were largely illiterate, superstitious, and morally indecadent. Anglo-New Mexicans reportedly feared that Mexicans would dominate a state government, so they opposed statehood unless restrictions can be written into the Constitution to curb the native power. Republican E.B. Spinola of New York and others criticized Republicans for opposing New Mexico statehood because it is Catholic and culturally Spanish. They go on to say, Spanish Americans of New Mexico are American by birth, sympathy, and education. They furnished more troops during the Civil War than some of the new states. New Mexico's bid for statehood was rejected when the proposal was dropped from Springer's Obinus or Catch-All Bill. Then we go on to look at another action that stalled our statehood. The celebrated Fountain murder case also served to delay action on New Mexico's statehood request. Albert Fountain and his eight-year-old son, Henry, disappeared in February of 1896. Fountain, an attorney, was involved in prosecuting alleged cattle rustlers, and grand jury indictments disappeared that night, as well as the bodies of the man and his son. The two men were tried in Sierra County for the murders, but since the bodies were never found, no conviction followed. The case was a national sensation, 
and the failure to get a conviction reinforced the sentiment that New Mexico was too lawless to deserve statehood. The statehood effort gathered steam in the early years of the last century. In 1902, W.S. Knox of Massachusetts introduced an ominous bill that would grant statehood to New Mexico, Arizona, and Oklahoma. Senator Albert J. Beveridge, Republican of Indiana, opposed statehood for Arizona and New Mexico, but accepted it for Oklahoma. He went on to say, New Mexico's insufficient population is Spanish, they know little English, illiteracy is high, and the land is too arid. Breveridge believed that the Southwest to be a backward area, not equal in intelligence, resources, or population to the other states in the Union. Because of its people, they're stifled by Indian and Spanish heritage, therefore not sufficiently American in their customs and habits. Senator Matthew S. Quay, Republican of Pennsylvania, attacked Beveridge's argument and spearheaded passage of a statehood bill. Presenting a number of arguments included thousands and thousands of new immigrants to America are permitted in without English language requirement. New Mexico's population is larger than that of some territories at the time of admission. No people were more loyal to the Civil War than the New Mexicans. On March the 4th, 1903, the statehood bill was defeated by use of parliamentary maneuvers. During the Spanish-American War, many of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders were from Mexico and he pledged his support to push to have New Mexico join the American Union. On December 5, 1905, when President Roosevelt called for the admission of New Mexico and statehood, and Arizona as one state, and Oklahoma Indian Territory as one, residents of New Mexico and Arizona have never petitioned for jointer, and the jointer debated raged in Congress. One congressman noted that New Mexico's predominantly Spanish-speaking population and Arizona's Anglo majority seemed to have an incompatible combination. The Pittsburgh Time was quoted as referring to the citizens of New Mexico as mongrel population too ignorant and lazy to assume the privilege of full citizenship. On July 19th, an editorial in the Las Vegas El Independiente warns New Mexicans that they are being written out of the Southwest historical record and that a vote for jointer will only speed up the process. On November 6, New Mexicans voted for jointer, but Arizonans rejected it, thus ending the movement forever. In 1907, in an apparent attempt to curry favor with Eastern statehood opponents, the territorial legislator enacted a statute that abolished women's community property rights that had been enforced for centuries under Spanish and Mexican laws and traditions. In keeping with Mex American law, now only the husband can dispose of property and women's property prior to marriage cannot be kept separate from that of her husband. Women can no longer make a will or designate heirs of their property. January 14, 1910, Representative Hamilton introduced an act referring to it as the Hamilton Bill to enable Arizona to form separate governments and become states on equal footing with other states. Senator Beveridge inserted an amendment that required close federal government supervision of any constitution the state draws up. This has never been done with any other state and contradicts New Mexico's entry into the Union on the equal footing with other states. Other Senate 
restrictions have to do with language, including what is taught in schools, and a requirement that state legislators, as well as state office holders, write and understand the English language well enough to conduct their duties without the aid of an interpreter. Unless the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was to be disregarded altogether, which would cause a censor from the international community, the English language stipulation was the only leverage available to control Hispanic political strengths and fortify Anglo privilege. On June 20th, President William Howard Taft signed the Enabling Act of 1910, which was the Hamilton Bill. New Mexicans can now form a government and prepare for statehood. In September, 100 delegates were elected to the Constitutional Convention. There are 71 Republicans, 29 Democrats chosen to write the Constitution. The 100 included 32 attorneys, 20 stockmen, 14 merchants, 7 farmers, 6 small business and saloon keepers, 3 bankers, 3 physicians, 3 editors, 3 territorial officers, 2 county officers, 1 mining man, and 1 lumber man. Spanish-speaking delegates are a third of the convention, causing the New York Sun to remark the proceedings will resemble the bullfight in a Mexican village. The Constitutional Convention organizes, finishes the proposed Constitution, and adjourns November 21, 1910. On January 21, 1911, the new Constitution was adopted by vote of the people by a margin of 18,343 votes. On August 21, 1911, Congress at long last passed the Act Admitting New Mexico to Statehood, and on January 6, 1912, President Taft signed a proclamation admitting New Mexico as the 47th of the United States, saying, Well, it's all over. I am glad to give you life, and I hope you will be healthy. The effort to become a state has taken almost 64 years.